The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittall Smith Chapter 16 The Joy of Obedience I remember reading once somewhere this sentence, perfect obedience would be perfect happiness, if only we had perfect confidence in the power we were obeying. I remember being struck with the saying, as the revelation of a possible, although hitherto undreamed of way of happiness, and often afterwards, through all the lawlessness and willfulness of my life, did that saying recur to me as the vision of a rest, and yet of a possible development, that would soothe and at the same time satisfy all my yearnings. Need I say that this rest has been revealed to me now, not as a vision, but as a reality, and that I have seen in the Lord Jesus, the Master to whom we may all yield up our implicit obedience, and, taking His yoke upon us, may find our perfect rest? You little know, dear hesitating soul, of the joy you are missing. The Master has revealed Himself to you, and is calling for your complete surrender, and you shrink and hesitate. A measure of surrender you are willing to make, and think indeed it is fit and proper you should. But an utter abandonment, without any reserves, seems to you too much to be asked for. You are afraid of it. It involves too much, you think, and is too great a task. To be measurably obedient you desire, to be perfectly obedient appalls you. And then, too, you see other souls who seem able to walk with easy consciences in a far wider path than that which appears to be marked out for you, and you ask yourself why this need be. It seems strange, and perhaps hard to you, that you must do what they need not, and must leave undone what they have liberty to do. Ah! Dear Christian, this very difference between you is your privilege, though you do not yet know it. Your Lord says, He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. You have his commandments, those you envy, have them not. You know the mind of your Lord about many things, in which, as yet, they are walking in darkness. Is not this a privilege? Is it a cause for regret that your soul is brought into such near and intimate relations with your Master, that he is able to tell you things which those who are further off may not know? Do you not realize what a tender degree of intimacy is implied in this? There are many relations in life which require from the different parties only very moderate degrees of devotion. We may have really pleasant friendships with one another, and yet spend a large part of our lives in separate interests, and widely differing pursuits. When together, we may greatly enjoy one another's society, and find many congenial points, but separation is not any especial distress to us and other and more intimate friendships do not interfere. There is not enough love between us, to give us either the right or the desire to enter into and share one another's most private affairs. A certain degree of reserve and distance is the suitable thing, we feel. But there are other relations in life where all this is changed. The friendship becomes love. The two hearts give themselves to one another, to be no longer two but one. A union of souls takes place, which makes all that belongs to one the property of the other. Separate interests and separate paths in life are no longer possible. Things which were lawful before become unlawful now, because of the nearness of the tie that binds. The reserve and distance suitable to mere friendship becomes fatal in love. Love gives all, and must have all in return. The wishes of one become binding obligations to the other, and the deepest desire of each heart is that it may know every secret wish or longing of the other, in order that it may fly on the wings of the wind to gratify it. Do such as these chafe under this yoke which love imposes? Do they envy the cool, calm, reasonable friendships they see around them, and regret the nearness into which their souls are brought to their beloved one, because of the obligations it creates? Do they not rather glory in these very obligations, and inwardly pity, with a tender yet exulting joy? the poor far off ones who dare not come so near? Is not every fresh revelation of the mind of one another a fresh delight and privilege, and is any path found hard which their love compels them to travel? Ah! Dear souls, if you have ever known this even for a few hours in any earthly relation, if you have ever loved a fellow human being enough to find sacrifice and service on their behalf a joy, if a whole-souled abandonment of your will to the will of another has ever gleamed across you as a blessed and longed-for privilege, or as a sweet and precious reality, then, by all the tender longing love of your heavenly Master, would I entreat you to let it be so towards God. He loves you with more than the love of friendship. 
as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so does he rejoice over you, and nothing but a full surrender will satisfy him. He has given you all, and he asks for all in return. The slightest reserve will grieve him to the heart. He spared not himself, and how can you spare yourself? For your sake he poured out in a lavish abandonment all that he had, and for his sake you must pour out all that you have without stint or measure. Oh, be generous in your self-surrender. Meet his measureless devotion for you, with a measureless devotion to him. Be glad and eager to throw yourself headlong into his dear arms, and to hand over the reins of government to him. Whatever there is of you, let him have it all. Give up forever everything that is separate from him. Consent to resign from this time forward all liberty of choice, and glory in the blessed nearness of union which makes this enthusiasm of devotedness not only possible but necessary. Have you never longed to lavish your love and attentions upon someone far off from you in position or circumstances, with whom you were not intimate enough for any closer approach? Have you not felt a capacity for self-surrender and devotedness, that has seemed to burn within you like a fire? and yet had no object upon which it dared to lavish itself? Have not your hands been full of alabaster boxes of ointment, very precious, which you have never been near enough to any heart to pour out? If, then, you are hearing the sweet voice of your Lord calling you into a place of nearness to Himself, which will require a separation from all else, and which will make this enthusiasm of devotedness not only possible, but necessary will you shrink or hesitate? Will you think it hard that he reveals to you more of his mind than he does to others, and that he will not allow you to be happy in anything which separates you from himself? Do you want to go where he cannot go with you, or to have pursuits which he cannot share? No. No, a thousand times, no. You will spring out to meet his dear will with an eager joy. Even his slightest wish will become a binding law to you, which it would fairly break your heart to disobey. You will glory in the very narrowness of the path he marks out for you, and will pity with an infinite pity the poor far off ones who have missed this precious joy. The obligations of love will be to you its sweetest privileges, and the right you have acquired to lavish the uttermost abandonment of all that you have upon your Lord, will seem to lift you into a region of unspeakable glory. The perfect happiness of perfect obedience will dawn upon your soul, and you will begin to know something of what Jesus meant when he said, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. And do you think the joy in this will be all on your side? Has the Lord no joy in those who have thus surrendered themselves to Him, and who love to obey Him? Ah, my friends, we are not fit to speak of this but surely the Scriptures reveal to us glimpses of the delight, the satisfaction, the joy our Lord has in us, that ravish the soul with their marvelous suggestions of blessedness. That we should need Him, is easy to comprehend, that He should need us, seems incomprehensible. That our desire should be towards Him, is a matter of course, but that His desire should be towards us, passes the bounds of human belief. And yet, over and over He says it, and what can we do but believe Him? He has made our hearts capable of this supreme, overmastering affection, and has offered Himself as the object of it. It is infinitely precious to Him, and He says, He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Continually at every heart he is knocking, and asking to be taken in as the supreme object of love. Wilt thou have me, he says to the believer, to be thy beloved? Wilt thou follow me into suffering and loneliness, and endure hardness for my sake, and ask for no reward but my smile of approval, and my word of praise? Wilt thou throw thyself with an utter abandonment into my will? Wilt thou give up to me the absolute control of thyself and all that thou art? Wilt thou be content with pleasing me and me only? May I have my way with thee in all things? Wilt thou come into so close a union with me as to make a separation from the world necessary? Wilt thou accept me for the I only Lord, and leave all others, to cleave only unto me? In a thousand ways he makes this offer of oneness with himself to every believer. But all do not say yes to him. Other loves and other interests seem to them too precious to be cast aside. They do not miss of heaven because of this. But they miss an unspeakable joy. You, however, are not one of these. From the very first your soul has cried out eagerly and gladly to all his offers, yes, Lord, yes. You are more than ready to pour out upon him all your richest treasures of love and devotedness. 
you have brought to him an enthusiasm of self-surrender that perhaps may disturb and distress the more prudent and moderate Christians around you. Your love makes necessary a separation from the world, which a lower love cannot even conceive of. Sacrifices and services are possible and sweet to you, which could not come into the grasp of a more half-hearted devotedness. The life upon which you have entered gives you the right to a lavish outpouring of your all upon your beloved one. Services, of which more distant souls know nothing, become now your sweetest privilege. Your Lord claims from you, because of your union with Him, far more than He claims of them. What to them is lawful, love has made unlawful for you. To you He can make known His secrets, and to you He looks for an instant response to every requirement of His love. Oh, it is wonderful! The glorious, unspeakable privilege upon which you have entered. How little it will matter to you if men shall hate you, or shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for his dear sake. You may well rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold your reward is great in heaven, and if you are a partaker of his suffering, you shall be also of his glory. In you he is seeing of the travail of his soul, and is satisfied. Your love and devotedness are his precious reward for all he has done for you. It is unspeakably sweet to him. Do not be afraid then to let yourself go in a heart whole devotedness to your Lord, that can brook no reserves. Others may not approve, but he will, and that is enough. Do not stint or measure your obedience or your service. Let your heart and your hand be as free to serve him, as his heart and his hand were to serve you. Let him have all there is of you, body, soul, and spirit, time, talents, voice, everything. Lay your whole life open before him that he may control it. Say to him each day, Lord, how shall I regulate this day so as to please thee? Where shall I go? What shall I do? Whom shall I visit? What shall I say? Give your intellect up into his control and say, Lord, tell me how to think so as to please thee? Give him your reading, your pursuits, your friendships, and say, Lord, give me the insight to judge concerning all these things with thy wisdom. Do not let there be a day nor an hour in which you are not intelligently doing His will, and following Him wholly. And this personal service to Him will give a halo to your life, and gild the most monotonous existence with a heavenly glow. Have you ever grieved that the romance of youth is so soon lost in the hard realities of the world? Bring God thus into your life and into all its details, and a far grander enthusiasm will thrill your soul than the brightest days of youth could ever know and nothing will seem hard or stern again. The meanest life will be glorified by this. Often, as I have watched a poor woman at her washtub, and have thought of all the disheartening accessories of such a life, and have been tempted to wonder why such lives need to be, there has come over me, with a thrill of joy, the recollection of this possible glorification of it, and I have said to myself, even this life, lived in Christ, and with Christ, following Him whithersoever He may lead would be filled with an enthusiasm that would make every hour of it glorious. And I have gone on my way comforted to know that God's most wondrous blessings thus lie in the way of the poorest and the meanest lives. For, says our Lord Himself, whosoever, whether they be rich or poor, old or young, bond or free, whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother, and my sister, and my mother. Pause a moment over these simple yet amazing words. His brother, and sister and mother. What would we not have given to have been one of these? Oh, let me entreat of you, beloved Christian, to come, taste and see for yourself how good the Lord is, and what wonderful things He has in store for those who keep His commandments, and who do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all His commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee, and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that shall rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face, they shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. 
the Lord shall command a blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee in holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. For the Israelites this was outward and temporal, for us it is inward and spiritual and, as such, infinitely more glorious. May our surrendered wills leap out to embrace it in all its fullness.